Good morning. Welcome to the final morning of the FMCS Future at Work Conference. Did you all enjoy the reception last night? Okay. Did you enjoy it a little too much? Well, if you did, grab another cup of coffee and come on back in and hang on to your seat. Uh, you may never see these four people on the stage again. Um, <laughs> But before I introduce them, uh, I want to introduce a very special guest who's going to uh, talk to you by video. Couldn't be here and was very unhappy about not being able to be here. So could we roll a video, please? My name is Philip Miscamara, and I'm a member of the National Labor Relations Board. You are in excellent hands today with FMCS Director Allison Beck, my two colleagues, Board Chairman Mark Pierce and our General Counsel Dick Griffin, and of course, Lynn Reinhardt from the AFL-CIO and Randy Johnson from the U.S. Chamber. Before my service as a board member, I worked in Chicago as a management side labor lawyer for 25 years. I realize this is the third day of your conference, but welcome, belatedly, to everything Chicago has to offer. Great music, deep dish pizza, a river that gets dyed green on St. Patrick's Day, and a robust, dynamic labor management community. In my Senate confirmation hearing, I testified that a multitude of difficult issues were resolved by labor management problem solving throughout my career. These issues involved health care challenges, manufacturing problems, customer service demands, and a lot more. The FMCS plays a vital role supporting this type of cooperation, and much of the NLRB's work is aimed at fostering constructive labor management relationships. Finally, let me explain why I'm appearing today by video. I can't be with you in person because I'm driving my oldest son, Andrew, to his first year of college. Andrew will be an engineering student at Michigan Tech University. Two fun facts about Michigan Tech. Number one, it's located in Houghton, Michigan, which is near the northern tip of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Fun fact number two, this means Michigan Tech is further north than many Canadian cities. It's further north than Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, and Quebec City. So yes, there are places in the Midwest that have colder winters than Chicago. Andrew, good luck. I also appreciate the chance to be here by video because my colleagues Mark and Dick can't interrupt me. On that front, I'll leave you with this. If Mark and Dick say any nice things about me, they're all true. Please accept my best wishes for the successful completion of your important work in Chicago. All right, let me now introduce the chairman, Mark Pierce. Mark has been chairman of the NLRB since 2011. Prior to becoming a board member and then chairman, Mark was a founding partner of the Buffalo, New York law firm of Creighton, Pierce, Johnson, and Giroux. <laughs> where he practiced union and side labor law. Um, now, I want to note that this is a very, very busy time at the board. Member Hirazawa's term is coming to an end. They're really furiously working on cases, um, and uh, it was really terrific that he took the time and was able to take the time to be here. So, Mark, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, Dick Griffin became the NLRB's general counsel in November 2013. Before that, he served for a time as a board member. I think Randy might have been responsible for the brevity of his service. <laughs> for many years, Dick was the general counsel of the operating engineers uh, and is uh, apparently loved by many people in this audience who barely let him come up the aisle here. Um, and we are delighted to have you too, Dick. Uh, phantom fact, Dick and I are now sort of related by marriage. My daughter married his best law school friend's son. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. Randy Johnson is Senior Vice President for Labor, Immigration, Employee Benefits at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Before joining the chamber in 1997, Randy was the Republican Labor Council and coordinator of the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. He also spent six years as Special Assistant to the Solicitor of Labor for Regulatory Affairs. Now, Randy was supposed to be fly fishing in Minnesota, 
And he came in and he reminded me rather curtly that his family was already in Minnesota. And I pointed out to him that because he was here, the board was not issuing decisions. And he said, <laughs> good point. <laughs> Lynn Reinhardt is the general counsel of the AFL-CIO, a federation of more than 56 national and international unions representing 12 and a half million working men and women. She joined the legal staff of the AFL as an associate general counsel in 96, and prior to attending law school, she served on the professional staff of the Senate Subcommittee on Labor, chaired by Senator Howard Metzenbaum. Lynn has incredible grace and humor and intelligence, as does Randy. I will just say, I won't say grace, I'll say <laughs> intelligence and humor. Uh, so, this is going to be a really interesting panel because all of us, just as all of us in this room, are grappling with the challenges of the 21st century workplace. We've been talking about it for two days. The NLRB is grappling with these challenges. How does an agency tasked with protecting workers' rights? Uh, to communicate about workplace issues, deal with digital communications and information technology? How does the board protect the freedom to choose representation or not in the cyber workplace where telecommuting is the norm? In an age of Uber, TaskRabbit, and a lot of leased workers, who is an employee? Who is an employer? Who's a joint employer? What is an appropriate bargaining unit? Whatever your position on these issues, I know you will find this discussion interesting and entertaining, um, because in the finest tradition of good labor management relationships, these professionals know how to disagree without being disagreeable. Right? We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Mr. Chairman, take it away. All right. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. I see a lot of my friends from Buffalo are here, and I'm, I'm glad to get the acknowledgement. Um, I'll, I'm going to uh, start out with this interesting concept. The, le the NLRB was born in an era where Congress was sympathetic to organized labor. However, after several decades of dynamic changes, union density dropping, uh, from a private sector high of 35 to now about 7%, um, we, we're dealing with a question of, well, what is collective bargaining all about? To the public, collective bargaining stopped getting credit for much of what is positive, but continues to receive plenty of blame about what is not state and municipal debt, uh, business costs, business flight. New generations accept and enjoy what they get as a result of the statutes and figure that it's the statutes that have given them these rights and they kind of forget what, what it took to get these things in the books. Um, a lot of people think that uh, there's a whole lot in the workplace that they're supposed to have like a right to privacy, a right to face one's accuser, freedom of association, uh, freedom of speech, workplace democracy. Uh, workers think that all of that is supposed to be what they get because that's what they see under the Constitution, but uh, they don't realize that that is the case, that is not the case, and in fact, it is the statutes that provide them with those kind of rights and those statutes uh, emanate from the presence of collective bargaining in our nation. Um, uh, <clears throat> what are we here to do as the National Labor Relations Board? We're here to minimize labor strife, ensure industrial peace, and to encourage collective bargaining. Um, that recognition, as I indicated, is but a faded memory at this point. Regardless of the uh, technological advancements that are, are made in the workplace and uh, regardless of the challenges that we face given this 81-year-old statute, yes, Janu uh, July last, last uh, month was our 81st birthday, so happy birthday, NLRB. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
But that doesn't stop new questions from being raised. A new economy is not all that different than the economy of yesterday, other than it's constantly changing. And what we have to do is adapt the statute, and we do it to the best of our ability. I'll get into those weeds a little bit later, but I give it over to the general counsel. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, be brief, which is very difficult for me. Uh, <laughs> It's great to be here and uh, to attend uh, what has obviously been such a productive and interesting conference. I want to thank uh, the director of FMCS, Alison Beck, for the work that she does, for the work that everyone at the FMCS does. <laughs> and for in inviting us uh, to be here. In addition, I always enjoy uh, uh, doing presentations uh, with Chairman Pierce. It was alluded to in the opening remarks that I spent 20 months as a constitutionally challenged recess-appointed board member. Uh, and during that time, uh, I uh, developed an even uh, greater relationship than I had previously had with Chairman Pierce. Uh, I, too, am from Buffalo, uh, a city which seems to have an, a propensity for uh, producing people with an interest in labor management relations. Bo former board member Sarah Fox was from Buffalo, uh, and a number of other people who have served honorably, John Truesdale and others at the NLRB, spent a fair bit of time in the Queen City of the Great Lakes. So uh, it, it's been a pleasure working with the chairman, and particularly uh, what I appreciate about the way the board is approaching uh, the issues uh, that we're going to talk about today is uh, it's not done in the dead of the night, it's not done uh, with stealth decisions, um, but rather uh, when there's an important issue, uh, whether it's uh, our graduate students, employees, whether it's uh, should supplied employees be allowed to be in a collective bargaining agreement with people who they work directly alongside, uh, what the board has done is uh, establish the procedure where there's a notice uh, to interested parties as well as uh, to the world at large uh, asking for briefing and uh, a considered judgment uh, comes after reviewing those briefs and after uh, uh, considering the arguments of all the parties. And so in the general counsel's office, what that means is that we know if we have a view of uh, what should be done on a particular aspect of the law, and the board is in fact interested in that law uh, or in that particular change, that we'll have the opportunity uh, to brief the, the uh, issue and that our uh, position, not always adopted, not always agreed with, but that it will be thoughtfully considered. And so I'm looking forward uh, to, to thoughtful consideration of a number of uh, issues from the board coming up, uh, and we'll get into those, uh, I think, in response to the questions from our two interlocutors. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for having me, and I look forward to this discussion. Well, first of all, let me thank Phil for sticking around and agreeing to help me out up here. Uh, <laughs> feel a little bit of like Custer at the Little Bighorn. I'm going to take a little different perspective, which is really not even talk about the board here. It just, you know, we all get into our silos and we're all experts in our areas, but from the standpoint of the U.S. Chamber and our members, I'd like to remind people on Capitol Hill in particular, but also in the agencies where administering very specific statutes, that when you're an employer out there, you're not just dealing with the board. That's actually a really small part of what employers have to deal with. A very uh, burr under the saddle at this point, but a small part. Uh, and they have to deal with statutes multiple across the board. And in this administration, a recent study came out where the Obama administration has issued something like 600 major regulations. Each one of those is, is $100 million worth of impact at least. Uh, and there's 50 more in the pipeline. George Bush was no, uh, was no piker in this area. He, he issued something like 496. According to this study, that amounts to about $743 billion worth of regulatory costs. 
you've probably seen the Crane study, which pegs it overall regulatory cost at about $2 trillion. Everyone can deal and argue with economists. The point is, is it's a lot of money. Um, and when employers are facing, how do I start a business? How do I start a business? How do I stay in business? There's the board, there's the EEOC, there's, there's the EPA. It goes on and on. And I think as we're having this discussion today, I'd just like the audience and, and all of us to keep in mind sort of the kinds of challenges employers really face out there in the real world and not just get so siloed in our own area. And one of my frustrations is with dealing with agencies, and I'm thinking of the Versinius case, I mean, I'm just bringing that one up, but that was one where the board looked at Section 7 rights and said, well, Section 7 rights in this case, I won't say Trump Title 7 rights, but it was a case where an employee used very vulgar words about women um, and the employer, thinking about their obligations under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, fired that person, and the board said, well, we're going to look at Section 7 rights because that actually chills that employee. But the employer was caught between a catch-22, and they're often in that situation. Um, and that's because they have to deal with multiple amounts of statutes where the board as an enforcement agency really sort of just looks at their own, and it's, it's a frustrating situation that employers face. Um, Rich Trump had talked about the growth yesterday or the problems of the middle class. We have 1.1 to 2 percent growth in this, in this country right now. There's no point in figuring out why that is. The Republicans have one view, the Democrats have another. But we're kidding ourselves if regulatory costs aren't part of that burden. And I'm just saying that has to be considered when people like these guys to my right are issuing decisions, and decisions, by the way, which don't go through a regulatory analysis such as regulations do. And I think that's kind of loss in this debate sometimes when we're talking about does the law have to be changed, et cetera. And with that, I'll pass it on to the left here. <laughs> <laughs> good, Randy. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to add my thanks to the force of nature that is Allison Beck for inviting me to participate in this conference and uh, in this panel. It's really an honor to be up here uh, with these panelists. Uh, a little bit intimidating, frankly, and but also an honor. And uh, Randy, you know, I told myself, don't let him goad you into comments, don't let him goad you into comments, but I have to say in terms of the uh, Obama administration issuing 600 regulations, and you said the Bush administration issuing 496 regulations, I bet you about 490 of those Bush regulations were repealing Clinton regulations, and about the same number of the Obama regulations were putting back in place the regulations that were repealed by the Bush administration. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, we might, we might agree that maybe someday we can get beyond undo, redo when it comes to labor policy, and that would be a really interesting conversation to have. Um, but enough about you know, talking about what Randy talked about. I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. Um, and uh, just a couple of things as introductory um, observations before we dive into some questions. First, just I want everybody to to look at these two guys down here. Randy sat back so they, they, they can look at these. <laughs> so that they can look at these two guys. So, yes, you, you sat back with great grace. So look at them. You know, so from some descriptions of Mark Pierce and Dick Griffin and their colleagues and predecessors, you would think that they are some kind of monster. You would think that they'd be sitting here in front of you with I love Karl Marx t-shirts on or you know, <laughs> capitalism with a slash through it or something like that. But you know, not so. They actually look it sound pretty normal, um, pretty normal. <laughs> and, uh, but you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it from the reaction that some of their decisions and actions have generated, um, particularly on Capitol Hill and also among some in the employer community. Uh, let's remember that the first law that the Republican Congress tried to pass when the Republicans took Congress back in the early part of this, um, this decade was a piece of legislation to defund the board. And then following that, there have been literally dozens of oversight hearings on the board's decisions and actions and on, uh, on you know, regulatory riders to try to block things that the board are, is doing. Uh, they've been the subject of two major Supreme Court decisions, constitutional law decisions that have impact not just on the board but on other agencies and operations of government. Um, but so, so you're in the news. You've gotten people's attention and you're in the news. And that's... Um, it's probably a challenge for you, and I have a question about that for later, but um, I think it's also, a, it's, it's a good thing. The board 
and the rights that the board enforces being in the news is a good thing. Um, when the board takes action and decides whether or not Section 7 and the National Labor Relations Act applies to conversations in the workplace that are electronic communications as opposed to verbal communications, um, and that gets in the news, and people think, oh, there is this law, and it protects rights like that, that's a good thing. When the board, when the board's general counsel, Dick's predecessor, issues a complaint against a major company for transferring work allegedly in retaliation for workers exercising union activity, or as Randy might say, issues a complaint for building a plant in the right to work state, right? <laughs> that was the other side. Um, you know, that's in the news. And so if people start thinking about and realizing that there's this law out there that, that protects very important rights. And I, I, I think that's to the good. Um, some are ready to write this law off and write you off and say you're either too weak or you're too strong and we need to move on. And uh, we're, we at the AFL-CIO and I as the general counsel of the AFL-CIO, we're not, we're not there. Um, this law is not perfect, far from it. Randy and I would agree. We might go at amending it differently, but, um, but, but it's the law that we have. And nobody yet has come up with a proposal for the system that would replace the system that we have right now through the National Labor Relations Board. And the rights and the process that this law establishes and that these board members and general counsel protect are so important, not just for the workers who depend on them, the employers who, who rely on the board telling us the collective bargaining process we operate under, and the communities, the, the workers and the communities that are impacted by collective bargaining and the wealth and, and growth that that brings to communities it's really important if anybody needs further you know, illustration of that, take a look at the article. There was an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of days ago called Why Las Vegas is a Great Place for Working Class Women. And it's a piece by a, ad, a professor who did a summer gig as a cocktail waitress in Las Vegas and enjoyed much uh, better dignity on the job, wages and benefits because of the efforts of the Culinary Workers Union in Las Vegas. It's a really inspiring piece that I really recommend to everybody. So, um, so we need you. So the point of all of that is we need you, and we depend on you. The last point I'd like to make before we go into some, uh, some questions for the board is that um, disagree or not with the decisions and actions of the National Labor Relations Board, and I'm sure everybody in this room and everybody on this panel has liked some of what they've done and not liked some of what they've done. This board, looking back to other boards, uh, that, that is the case, but, um, Nobody, I think, can argue with the quality and the professionalism and the integrity and experience of the individuals that President Obama has decided to appoint to the National Labor Relations Board over the eight years of, the, of his term. And I'm including both the Democrat and the Republican appointees in that mix. Um, Phil Miskimara is an extremely experienced, knowledgeable practitioner. And I just really, you know, credit to the president for picking solid, experienced practitioners to be on this board and making the decisions that they make. Um, and whether we disagree with the decisions or not, I know that they are approaching their work in the utmost good faith and with real pro professionalism and integrity, and that's to the good of all of us. So, so thank you for that. Um, now, um, in the time that we have here together this morning, we are going to be engaging in uh, a, a, a forced exercise of labor management cooperation that Allison Beck forced upon Randy and me. Um, labor and management cooperating Is that to. 882 violation? I think it might be, yeah. To, <laughs> to facil facilitate a discussion with the general counsel and chairman of the National Labor Relations Board. And we have some questions um, that we would like to ask uh, our panelists, but we also would be interested if anybody in the audience has questions uh, that you're dying to ask the board or the, the board chairman or the general counsel. Um, please bring them up to us. Write them down on a piece of paper. Oh, there are cards. They're okay. And the mediators are going to bring them up. So just raise your hand if you have a question, and the mediators will pick up your question. And then Randy and I will consult and see if we can negotiate and agree on whether or not we ask that question. And it's just this grand experiment, and who knows how it's going to turn out, but hopefully well. <laughs> so with that, by way of context and introduction, I will stop and turn it back to Randy yeah. to ask the first question. Well, after all those praiseworthy worthy comments about the guys to my right here, um, let me just ask sort of a metaphysical question, I guess, which is, it's not partisan one way or the other, but I think probably most people in this room love labor law, that's why we're doing it, and we even sort of love reading the cases you guys hand down. Uh, I read Miller Anderson on the way over here, and it was, you know, I'm not gonna get into whether it was right or wrong, but it was 
certainly uh, detailed reasoning. Uh, but we enjoy that kind of stuff. But you know, you mentioned, Mark, that you just had your 80, 80 first birthday, 80 years after the Taft-Hartley Act, and you know, and then we had, I mean, after Wagner Act and then Taft-Hartley in 47. We're still dealing with lots of uncertainties in this area of the law, and then it flips and it flops, um, and then you gotta read the cases, and there's an old saying where, you know, you can find an ALJ decision to mean anything you want if you, if you look hard enough. And that's what employers are confronted with, and, and lawyers are making rich, are getting rich off it, and certainly the resurgence of the board has made a lot of old white males happy who saw this area of the law diminishing. They're now back, back in the soup. Um, but is that, is that a great, is that a crazy system that 80 years after the statute's been around, it hasn't matured more to where we have set rules of the road and we know what we're doing? And maybe the answer is um, when we get Republicans back in to go through regulations. But um, instead of case law, but I don't know. I mean, I'm just opening it up, and it, it, maybe it's a problem generally with our judicial system. But it's a crazy system where no one really knows what the law is. And, and litigators and judges and, and more people in the public sometimes are under the impression, certainly not litigators and judges, people in the public are, are under the impression, oh yeah, just do X and you're in compliance with the law. Let's face it, it's not that clear. Isn't that kind of a crazy system we're dealing with and, and isn't it true about under the NLRA? 80 years later, it's not like a new statute. Mm. Well, I agree that it is an old statute and it is an old statute that is required to be applied to uh, the modern society, sort of like the Constitution is required to be uh, applied to, to, to modern society, irrespective of the arguments going back and forth as to whether or not it exactly can apply to a particular circumstances. Um, we are in a situation where uh, the, the country, business models, um, status of employer and employee, uh, technology, all come together to create different and unique circumstances that the board is faced to apply that 81-year-old statute to. And in that, re in, that, in that respect, not only are we looking at uh, things that we haven't seen before, we're also looking at things that we saw before, but we have to look in at in 21st century eyes. For example, if we, if we look at the, the, the decades old decision in, in, in Yeshiva University and uh, saw what the relationship of, of faculty was in, in that college to the modern day university structure and, and the relative status of, of faculty members here, um, we had to take a look again at, at, at whether or not what the Supreme Court says in, in Yeshiva University is aptly applied to the 21st century typical university. I mean, then we got, we got Northwestern, since we're here in, in, in Chicago, where we, we're faced with the question of whether or not uh, athletes uh, that are on scholarship uh, should should be able to unionize. Well, we decided based on a lot of criteria that had little to do with the employer-employee status, but more so in terms of how that particular um, NCAA slash university private sector versus per public sector structure uh, laid out, decided to back off and say, well, we, we, we won't assert jurisdiction in that situation because our job is to promote Pr promote labor stability, and the, and our intervention would create an unstable environment. Now, uh, the employers and employees and unions need us to interpret the law because we set labor policy um, with respect to the to to the private sector. Our task is continues to be a challenging one because of the aforementioned changes that, that, every, that, that, that is brought. Um, technology creates a question as to whether or not we're talking about con protected concerted activity when we issue an email or we post something or on Facebook. 80 years ago, there was no internet um, until certain people invented it. 
I do. Um, but, but, they, the, but the question is, who is going to make that call? Do, do we really think that we got to wait for legislation to, to, to issue to make that call constantly? That's, they, the legislation that was created was, was to have us be able to uh, uh, utilize and apply that law, and sometimes with great difficulty uh, to the modern society, and I think we do a, a pretty good job given the t tools that we have to work with. Yeah, I'm just going to supplement that with two points. First, uh, I'm a little surprised to hear Randy making an argument for uh, rulemaking by the board. Um, as most of you know, the, the board generally adopts rules through case-by-case -case adjudication, but has occasionally tried uh, to engage in rulemaking activity. And rulemaking seems to be a good idea until it's attempted, in which case uh, there is always a lawsuit uh, to enjoin the rule that is adopted. That's been the uniform practice with every rule that the board has adopted. And so um, I will take a stipulation that the chamber is in favor of additional rulemaking by the board. The second uh, point that I would make is that, uh, is that I think it's a little bit, and, and I'm not at all unsympathetic to the difficulties of people trying to grapple with reading extended decisions, but I think it's a little bit, um, Sometimes we focus on the tip of the iceberg rather than what's below the water, and uh, there are more than 20,000 charges filed uh, with the board every year, and the vast majority of those charges are resolved at the regional level without litigation, without a decision by uh, the board, and those, uh, those settlements, 92.7% of the merit determinations by the board last year were cases that were settled without litigation. Um, those settlements involve putting people back to work, getting them back pay, uh, and all the sort of mundane, in some ways, uh, but absolutely critical and necessary things uh, that we need to have to enforce the statute. So while it is the case that there are a lot of decisions over time, and sometimes they are difficult to parse, I think it's it's not necessarily focusing on the real work of the agency always just to focus on the decisions. And, uh, and I think that uh, a vast amount of good work is done uh, enforcing this statute that never makes it into the law books. Um, I think I'm going to pick up on the, the gist of, of Randy's question and put a little finer point on it and, and ask you to comment on it. In a, particular application. This is the, you know, taking an 80-year-old law and applying it to a changing economy and changing workplaces and changing circumstances. Um, so thinking about this panel last night, I, I thought about, okay, 1935, what was going on in 1935? And I just want to throw this out there for us to think about. Let's see, in 1935, a car cost $580. Gas was 19 cents a gallon. A house cost $6,300. A stamp was three cents. And the average salary for an American worker was 1,500 bucks. Um, also in 1935, the Michigan uh, girl here would like to say that the Tigers won the World Series and the Lions were the NFL champions. And it was probably the only time in history that Detroit held both of those championships at the same time. But yay, yay Detroit. Um, and um, other fun fact, in 1935, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded. And the National Labor Relations Act was passed. So <laughs> it was quite a year. Um, so there's your statute. It was, it's 81 years old. You need to apply it to changing circumstances. And one set of circumstances that you've had to grapple with and you've gotten some criticism for is applying it to the employment relationship and the, the changing employment relationship and this whole issue of who is the employer, joint employer, um, and how that all works. Um, the Browning-Ferris decision where you applied the joint and, and modified the joint employer standard to fit better the current realities of our economy um, generated a lot of criticism. You would have thought the board invented joint employer, <laughs> that it came, you know, they came to you from, from Divine. In fact, that's not the case. It's been around for since the beginning of uh, these statutes. But, but it's a very um, notable example of the board um, 
trying to apply doctrine to changing times. And so can you talk a little bit more about that and um, how you view that and, and what that all means from the perspective well, let, of let the- say, I think the chamber definitely would have preferred rulemaking on Brown and Ferris rather than the Brown and Ferris case. So yeah, we do prefer yeah. rulemaking in certain so cases. So can we talk about joint employer and the employment, no. that, the, employment <laughs> the fissured employment relationship and how you're, you're going at that? Well, let me tell you about Browning Ferris. Bra Browning Ferris was basically a pretty simple case. And the, the thing that makes it difficult in the blogosphere is that everybody's looking over the shoulders of Browning Ferris and, and is looking at franchises. Uh, Browning Ferris was not a franchise case, and I'm not going to speak about franchises because they're not in front of me. But what we were talking about here is an employer who uh, was was um, uh, in, had, had a recycling plant with a conveyor belt. They hired a uh, supplier employer to do all of the sorting and so forth. And that su supplier employer organized and they, they, uh, the issue was whether or not Browning Ferris should be considered a joint employer with the supplier. Now that supplier uh, had employees doing, the, doing work very similar, in fact, exactly the work of some of the sorters that Browning Ferris um, uh, employed directly. Now, we were talking about a situation where Browning Ferris not only um, uh, had a contract with a supplier that was a, a, uh, at will, um, could, be term could be terminated at will, they, they had the reserve the authority to deny the supplier uh, the ability to utilize certain employee, uh, employees. They dictated where the staffing was to be, uh, be utilized, and they dictated um, how the staff was going to be paid because they said, look, you could pay the staff anything that you want as long as it's not any higher than what we pay our sorters. Um, and and um, they also revert, reserved the right to deny uh, employment to employees of the staffers um, for any reason they came up with or no reason at all. So it was illustrative of, of a, a policy, and of course there were other factors that, that, that uh, I would commend to your reading, um, uh, but uh, this was a, a classic example of the intertwined involvement of two employers that, that called for joint employer consideration because how could an employee uh, organization effectively negotiate with one employer without the other employer's influence being brought to the table as well. Now, the significant difference between that and where, where we were previously is that um, reserved authority that is indirect was brought to the forefront as a relevant consideration in de determining whether an employer an employer should be considered a joint employer. Previously, all of that couldn't be considered. And, it, and it, an employer could, a, a, um, a client employer could reserve the, the authority to determine uh, what, what the scheduling is. They could reserve the authority to de determine um, um, how many people can, can, can work on a shift, how much overtime and so forth to, to takes place and not be considered a primary employer and not be considered an employer that has joint employer status. And the case law was such that those reserve considerations would not be factors in the decision making. We changed that. Uh, Dick, do you want to comment on how the general counsel's office is approaching this issue? Or well, I, I think the chairman uh, made the point that the statute uh, seeks to promote effective collective bargaining, and it's difficult to figure out uh, how you can have effective collective bargaining if one party that shares or, or co-determines essential terms and conditions of employment isn't at the table. And so uh, I think uh, we haven't seen any major uptick in uh, joint employer uh, allegations uh, since 
uh, Browning Ferris was decided, but if you have a situation where multiple entities are involved in sharing or co-determining uh, essential terms and conditions of employment, it would seem fairly straightforward that uh, in order to have effective collective bargaining, you need those entities to be either at the table or bound uh, to, to the agreement uh, or bound to the process. So that's the way we're looking at these issues as they come up. And there are a number of doctrines, the single employer doctrine, the joint employer doctrine, the alter ego doctrine. These are doctrines that have been in existence for, for many, many years and they're all designed to make sure that the people who are responsible uh, are engaged in the process. Well, as Lynn said, the joint employer doctrine's been around a long time, and so it's successorship, et cetera. Um, yeah, they're not new, Dick, uh, but the problem, I think, from people from the perspective at the chamber and certainly many lawyers out there is you guys did change the rules of the road to reach a certain preordained result, which was we want to get these people over here and bring them to the bargaining table because that's what we think is the right thing to do, and then we're going to change the law to make sure that happens. Uh, now, Mark, you, you recommended some peop people uh, read some articles in this area. I think I'd commend the people here in, in, in the room to read several hearings that have happened on Capitol Hill where small businesses have testified about the impact of the joint employer, uh, the new joint employer standard. Here's one quote. The new joint employer the new joint employer proposal will likely lead to store closures, job losses, and reduced economic activity and community support. Um, it will destroy the ability of many middle class minority individuals like myself to be able to use franchising to obtain the American dream. Now, you know, even if you interject a little hyperbole there, because you got to do that when you testify on Capitol Hill to get members' attentions um, and skip the nuances, it's not like these people are are tools of, of the chamber, um, and they didn't even testify on behalf of the chamber in this case. These are people who are struggling to figure out how, what are the rules of the road, and you guys are changing them. And I just think, uh, I don't think these people are stupid or ignorant, and, and I, I'm afraid, I've got to say it, that I think sometimes back there at the board, you guys are looking at these things in a very esoteric manner and not figuring out a lot of the real world implications. And I'm sorry, a lot of the perspective of people out there is, is, is you're driven by how do we make it easier for unions to organize, and we're going to change the law to make it easier for unions to organize. Um, and that's a problem with, I think we'll dig into this, and then I'll probably have, have a different disagreement. Um, and the board, you know, the NLRA was there to make effective collective bargaining, but that's not just what it's all about. It's also to balance these very difficult competing uh, problems in the American economy. Um, so there's a lot of different views on Browning and Ferris to say that it was a major change in the law it means there's a lot of smart people out there who are just lying about it, and I don't think that's the case. It was a major change. It was a major change that was made for a reason, and was made to bring employers to the bargaining table who otherwise wouldn't have been brought to the bargaining table. Um, can I jump in before you go to the next question and just say that um, I have to say when I read Browning Ferris and I read the facts of the case and the degree of control that Browning Ferris had over the working conditions of the 80% of the workforce that were supplied by the temporary agency, I thought to myself, how can it be that this isn't a joint employer under the laws that existed prior to the board's Browning Ferris case? I mean, really, if you're going to have meaningful bargaining and that level of control, it just, it, it, to me, it really pointed up how wacky the old standard was and how, um, how it didn't really relate to the, to the current workforce um, where you have control but you don't want responsibility. And I just think the Brown and Ferris decision um, goes a long way toward, toward cleaning that up. But I do wonder whether the reaction to the Brown and Ferris decision would have been different had it not been issued six months after the general counsel issued a complaint against McDonald's for being a joint employer with uh, McDonald's corporate, a joint employer with some of its franchises. And I've said, I, I kind of think some of the outcry about the Browning Ferris decision is because it was decided in the shadow of the Golden Arches, the complaint by the general counsel um, against right. McDonald's. And I, I wonder, Randy, whether or not. No, I think you, that's you, right. You, because you people. Uh, McDonald's, was, McDonald's was the old, the new Boeing. Uh, in the sense of people that they folk could understand the Boeing case was going to move. And I always thank, thank Leif Solomon for the Boeing case because it allowed me to go to the Hill and educate staff as to what the NLRA stood for, National Labor Relations Act. Many people didn't even know about it. Uh, but McDonald's, people that could understand the Golden Arches and sort of get that. And I think that's, I think you're right, Lynn. So, Got that, Randy? So, so, I, so I, think, <laughs> I think since the McDonald's complaint is the is the triggering factor, perhaps it might be worth saying a few things about uh, 
the general counsel's view with respect to franchisors and franchisees. The first thing is that um, I have uh, gone out of my way uh, to meet every train uh, with respect to this issue uh, and speak to the ABA Forum on Franchising, the Board of Directors of the International Franchise Association, uh, every business group that I could speak to because, in fact, I'm going to take very strong issue with what Randy said. There has been an active campaign uh, to misrepresent what's going on in the McDonald's case. The first thing to know about the McDonald's case is that the complaint was issued, and I have said this on multiple occasions to multiple oversight uh, inquiries, the complaint was issued under the old standard. So Browning Ferris and the new standard, which we were arguing for at the time, a change in the standard, the McDonald's complaint would have issued in any event. Uh, and that's because the general counsel's office believes very strongly that under the old standard, uh, the involvement of McDonald's uh, corporate is sufficient to demonstrate joint employer status. That's number one. Number two, at the same time, or approximately the same time, as Browning Ferris was under consideration, uh, there was an advice memo that we put out, and advice is a division of the general counsel's office in Washington that uh, the regions send in difficult questions or precedential matters uh, so that they can be reviewed uh, to make sure that we're consistent in our positions. Uh, there was an advice memo with respect to a franchisor called Freshies. And uh, in that uh, advice memo went through the factors both under the then current standard and under the standard that the uh, general counsel was arguing for in Browning Ferris and found no joint employer relationship between a franchisor and a franchisee. And it is highly unlikely in the vast majority of franchisor-franchisee relationships, and I have said this on multiple occasions publicly, that there will be any, uh, any uh, joint employer finding. Uh, and uh, moreover, for those who are saying that the board's joint employer decision should make people rethink uh, their business relationships, what they need to realize is that uh, the board's decision is based on the common law, uh, and the board goes through in great detail the common law factors as the board was urged to do by the Chamber of Commerce amicus brief that was filed in the Browning Ferris case. Now, it just so happens that there's another law, and, and Randy quite rightly said in his opening remarks, that uh, businesses are subject to multiple statutory requirements. And one of those laws is the wage and hour uh, law, the Fair Labor Standards Act. And that act applies to every employer and applies to every hour worked, and that law has a much broader definition of employer than the National Labor Relations Act does. It's to suffer or permit to work. And the Supreme Court has said that that definition is much broader than uh, the definition under the common law. And so the question that occurs to me is why is there outrage over an action by the National Labor Relations Board uh, when in fact there's already pre-existing a statute that applies to all these employers that has a much broader joint employer standard. So my response to that, and the first time I said this was in front of 900 franchisor franchisee lawyers at the ABA meeting, is the re where, and I was sitting next to the wage and hour administrator, and I was kind of patting him on the back, and they were being nice to him. Uh, <laughs> and I, and I, said, I said, the reason for this is because there is general broad public acceptance of the underlying public policy principles for the wage and hour law, and there is still a contest over whether or not the public policy that is expressed in the National Labor Relations Act is appropriate public policy. And that is the reason for all this. It's not because the board is acting outside the context of the statute. The Browning Ferris decision is grounded in the common law as asked for by the Chamber of Commerce. And the reason is not because that this is an extraordinary decision, that this is a decision that goes beyond what is appropriate under the, the board's jurisdiction. The reason is because the underlying 
public policy decision that Congress made in 1935 is still a very actively contested public policy decision. Well, um, all these areas lead to greater uncertainty out there, which, which keeps businesses from spending the money they need to create jobs. And, and that's what I hear from my small business guys when the rubber meets the road. Speaking of uncertainty, let me just ask about Section 7 rights. Um, and obviously, I still, get, I still get sort of questions sometimes about, oh, you mean uh, parts of the National Labor Relations Act applies to non-unionized workplaces? Yeah, it's called Section 7. Uh, it's been around for a while. But uh, and it always has been. But the board, Dick, I think under your leadership in particular, uh, has now gone into the whole area of, uh, of, of examining handbooks. And as I understand it from practitioners, even when a, a, a complaint is issued, uh, on a, like an 8A1 or something, the board takes it upon themselves to use that as a hook to examine uh, the employer handbooks, et cetera, to see if there's something in there that might chill Section 7 rights. You know, there's kind of crazy cases out there. I'm not going to go through them. I'm sure there's good cases from your perspective. Um, I guess I just sort of wonder, are there no real bad employers out there anymore? Like, like that when Congress was thinking about the Wagner Act and Taft-Hartley and they created the National Labor Relations Act to go after, I mean, is this a, is this a good use of your resources that you guys are always complaining about you don't have enough of on Capitol Hill, and fortunately we've been able to keep your budget level uh, but, uh, so far? But it just seems odd to me. It's almost like the agency's looking for something to pick off to keep themselves busy rather than, or is there fact, rather than going after the truly bad actors, unless there's no truly bad actors left, or a few of them. Well, you know, <laughs> your, your question raises so many uh, points of response that it's difficult to choose between them. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but, but let me say a couple of things. First of all, apropos the application to, uh, to uh, non-union workplaces, you know, the Washington Aluminum case, which was decided in about 1960 by a unanimous Supreme Court, involved a group of people who were unorganized, uh, no union present, who were working in a very cold facility and protested the cold facility by walking off the job. And the Supreme Court said that is action protected by the National Labor Relations Act, despite the fact that there was no union present, there was no involvement. So point number one, and I'm going to be very pedantic about this because this is how my mind works. Point number one, the law applies to uh, joint activity by unorganized workers seeking to advance their uh, terms and conditions of employment, even in the absence of any labor organization or organizing uh, uh, drive. P point number two, point number two, uh, the mere maintenance of a rule that chills employees' rights to engage in this type of activity without it being enforced has been unlawful for a very long time. Uh, when I started at the board in the early 80s, uh, there were a lot of cases about no solicitation uh, rules, and it went back and forth, back and forth, and then in our way, in 1984, the board sort of set the standard, and it's continued all along, but the principal point is that it's for a long time the mere maintenance of a rule that chills conduct has been a violation of the act, and this applies both to uh, employers and unions. I lost cases on provisions in when I was uh, union uh, counsel on, on rules that restricted employees' ability to resign, members' ability to resign from the union. There's a case called Tribune Properties that I lost uh, uh, concerning a provision of the, of the International Union of Operating Engineers Constitution. Uh, hadn't been enforced, hadn't been understood the way it was applied, uh, but it was a restriction on resignation. And uh, we argued, oh, we've got 45,000 Canadian members. It could be applied to them without the board having any jurisdiction. We have a bunch of public employees that we represent. Board didn't want to hear it. We lost the case, had to remove the provision. So this notion that this is some recent attempt by the board to get into an area uh, is belied. And, and I will just end on this note. Uh, it has been unlawful for a very long time to have a rule that restricts employees' ability to discuss wages and terms and conditions of employment. Despite the fact that it has been unlawful for a very long time, a recent study done in, in preparation for the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Act 
uh, uncovered the fact that in 61% of employer handbooks surveyed, there was a restriction uh, subjecting people to discipline if they discussed their wages, terms, and conditions of employment. So the notion that the board ought to just take a pass on this stuff, that employers, as a, as a general matter, I think employers are interested in having their rules uh, be proper, not restrict uh, chilling uh, employees' rights. And that's why in the general counsel's office, we put out a memorandum talking about good language that had been approved and bad language that was no good in an attempt to assist employers uh, to make sure that they were complying uh, with the rules of the road. But I do think that the ubiquity of these provisions that restrict people's uh, uh, ability to talk about their wages in terms of conditions of employment is something that if we were effectively uh, addressing this, uh, it wouldn't be present any longer. I would just add that <clears throat> um, rather than viewing it as the board looking for, th for things to do, I would submit that it is a wake-up call for management council to look for something to do, basically, to go to their clients and see what their handbook says and review that handbook and tell them that they need to change these obviously antiquated illegal practices that they have printed in black and white. Uh, and why I feel a little bit passionate about it is this. When a rule is clearly overtly um, unlawful, it's a simple matter that can be, can be dealt with because uh, um, on its face the problem is there. But when a rule is ambiguous, when a rule um, is structured in a way that employees don't know whether or not their Section 7 rights are being impacted because of how it's articulated, an employee is going to self-suppress their activities because employees don't want to get in trouble. So what happens is the the ripple effect of an ambiguous law that, that uh, is d d by design or by ignorance or inadvertence has the effect of suppressing Section 7 rights has an untold effect on the rights of employees in this country. Um, thank you for that. We, um, we unfortunately are running out of time here and I want to thank everybody in the audience for your really excellent questions, some of which we've tried to incorporate and some of which we haven't gotten to. Um, and I think we have time for one more and uh, it's a, it's a future looking one and so I think it's appropriate to end, given the theme of future of work of this conference to end um, on this note. Um, so I'm going to ask the question and then I'm going to slide in a little sub question that I kind of think you may not answer but I'm going to, I can't help myself, I have to ask it anyway. Um, so. The question is, how, does, how do you see the NLRB impacting the, work, the, the workforce and the workplace 10 years down the road? Like, look ahead, and what do you see the, this agency and the law that you enforce, how do you see that applying to the workforce 10, 15 years down the road? Sub-question, when are we going to know whether grad student employees are covered by the National Labor Relations Act? <laughs> so is, is your question... Uh, this agency with a budget or this agency without a budget? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, well, what, what I see with respect to this agency is an agency that is taking education about the National Labor Relations Act out to the streets. We talked about um, uh, the de union density de diminishing. One aspect of the union density's dim diminishment in this country is the fact that a source of, of education about employee rights is, is, has been likewise diminished. Um, it is incumbent upon us to educate everybody as much as we can about what they know. Thank goodness for Facebook. Why? Because millennials were interested for five seconds in, in fa Facebook. And they discovered that, hey, I can talk about these things, and that could be a violation of some law. What law is it? Well, Perez Hilton started talking about it, and CNN started talking about it, and, and, and MTV started talking about it, because it was out there for the public to see. 
we need the National Labor Relations Act to be out there publicly in the same manner that so many other things that, that, that the media has, has to offer uh, educating the folks. And then we will get a stimulation and a lack of misconception about the law. And that goes for both employers and employees because employers want to do the right thing and they want to know. I'm equally interested as you are in when we'll know whether or not graduate uh, students are employees, uh, but the chairman didn't address that and I wouldn't expect him to because that's obviously a matter that's under consideration actively, I hope. Uh, like, Chris, like Christmas, it's coming. <laughs> Or, or for you Game of Thrones fans, like winter. Uh, so so uh, the one thing that I would say is that I would, and this is a, a kind of a narrow uh, response, is that um, obviously one of the big questions in the so-called gig economy and, w and that a, a number of uh, these platform operations have um, raised is whether or not the people who perform the work are employees or independent contractors. And I think that um, 15 years down the road, that issue, which you know has been an issue under the National Labor Relations Act for a long time in a lot of contexts, there are a number of Supreme Court cases involving the question of whether newspaper delivery people were independent contractors back in the 40s. Um, I think we'll have some answers to that in some, you know, and there are a lot of different contexts. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, uh, gig economy employers. Um, and I think 15 years down the road, we'll see a fair bit of development in that area. Um, but that's as much as I'm going to speculate. We could go on forever. We barely scratched the surface. We didn't get to talk about the NLRB's election rules and so many other really important and interesting things. But um, you've given us a great overview of some really pressing issues that are right before you at the National Labor Relations Board. And um, speaking for myself, I know I learned a lot listening to you. And I'm guessing that the same is true for everybody in the room. So on behalf of all of us, I just really want to thank the panelists. And what an honor to, to get to hear from our chairman and our general counsel and the Chamber of Commerce on it. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you.